welcome to this session. I'm Dr. Sally Bell. I'm the chair for today for this session. And we're going to be looking at the importance of nutrient density of our food, asking some questions of what is nutrient density? Why is nutrient density important? Does how we farm affect the nutrient density of our food? And how do we measure it as food producers and as consumers? I've got two wonderful speakers who are going to go into more depth answering some of these questions. And they're both going to bring their presentations and then we'll have a time for some question and answer sessions at the end. But I wanted to set the context a little bit of why we decided we wanted to bring this session to you. I'm Dr. Sally and I'm a medical doctor for the last 21 years. And I'm going to bring a little bit of setting that context from my medical perspective. I'm not a researcher and I'm not an academic. I'm a clinician on the ground treating a lot of very sick people. I've been a GP for 21 years and it's taken me around the world in my work. And um, about 10 years into my career, back in about 2010, I found myself feeling like a pharmaceutical vending machine. You would come into my clinic and I would in 10 minutes give you a diagnosis, give you a label, and then often treat you with pharmaceutical drugs driven and pharmaceutical driven guidelines. And I was always treating the disease and never really treating you, often suppressing symptoms and never getting to the root of why you're unwell, treating a part of you and not a whole of you and often just treating you as an individual and not in the context of your family and our communities. And at that point, I lost my own health, got given my diagnoses, got given my medication for life. And I stood back and asked the question, is there have to be, there has to be another way of treating disease? And I went back to the books. I went back to you know, how um, our body functions and asked some questions. And in that time, actually, over the last sort of 30 years since I've trained, so much of the science has come on. And here's the thing, when we look at chronic disease, like in our nation here in the UK, one in two of us will get cancer in our lifetime. 50% of our children will have a clinical diagnosis by the age of 18. One in three of us are overweight or um, obese as adults. And we are seeing escalating cases of suicide and mental health issues and autoimmune disease. And it's just escalating as is our prescribing. And when we look at these chronic diseases, one of the things we realize when you look at the research is that 10% is due to the genetics. It's due to what we've inherited from our parents. But actually 90% is due to our lifestyle decisions. And actually we have an incredible amount of agency over our own health. And I use a foundation, some five foundations to help people recover their health. That includes sleep and movement, it includes rest, tackling stress, it includes connection with self, others and purpose, but it also includes nutrition. And that's why I, as a medic, are really um, excited to be part of this conference and excited to have this discussion today. But it wasn't until about two years ago, up until that point, I'd just been trying to pull people away from eating highly processed food and getting them to eat real food. Again, here in the UK, 50% of our diet comes from highly processed food, which is devoid in nutrition. And I've been pulling people to eat real food, but I hadn't looked further enough upstream. I hadn't realized how important it was to ask the question of where our food was coming from. I had been a clinician for 18 years, thought myself as educated, but knew nothing of the farming system, nothing of the, far the farmer's story, nothing of the importance of the health of our soil and the impact it was having on our food. And the reason within that context of, of practicing those five foundations that we need nutrient dense food is because our bodies are wired to heal. We have an innate ability to keep ourselves cancer free, to keep ourselves disease free. And what our bodies need is the right environment. And part of that solution is having the right nutrition on board. And so I'm really excited to introduce our speakers as we dig a bit deeper into the importance of nutrient density. Our first speaker is uh, Dan Ketteridge. He's dialing in from the States and he's been an organic farmer for over 30 years. And he is the founder and executive director of Bionutrient Food Association. And BFA is a nonprofit whose mission is to increase the quality of the food supply. And he is known as the leading proponent of nutrient density. 
And Dan works to demonstrate that connection between soil health, plant health and human health. So over to you, Dan. I'm looking forward to listening to you. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> um, and an honor to be here. Um, as Sally said, I'm from the States. I'm from Massachusetts. I, I grew up on an organic farm and I have been um, involved in the organic and uh, sort of sustainable ag food movement community for most of my life. Um, as a farmer myself, uh, struggling with issues of uh, pest and disease pressure, which is, you know, we think very similar to what humans are experiencing with, um, you know, our, our own diseases. Uh, I began to understand that the environment that the uh, plant was grown in uh, directly affected its health, its nutrient density, its flavor, its aroma, its pest and disease resistance, all these things correlate beautifully, um, as does the soil health, the carbon sequestration, the ecosystem function. Um, and understanding the, um, you know, the fact that the way that m most people get food is through buying it, um, and that the ways of discernment in the sort of the larger supply chain are pretty limited. You can have organic or not organic, Maybe you can have, um, you know, non-GMO these days. But what we uh, began to understand is that there's a really significant variation within food. So within between this carrot and that carrot, between this milk and that milk, uh, there's dramatic nutrient variations that correlate with how those uh, foods are, are grown, produced, etc. Um, and so we've got a, um, a campaign that we've started, the Real Food Campaign, uh, 19, uh, 2016. With a few partner organizations um, and it's been spreading and i'd like to share the process that we're engaging to begin to answer some of these questions about what is nutrient density what causes it and uh for the consuming you know um audience how can i find it so i'll just I'll quickly run through here some some of my slides and then hopefully have a few minutes left to um discuss more broadly so this is just uh runs through where we've been um starting in 2005, looking at this organizationally more significantly, started the Real Food Campaign in 2008 uh, to begin to do this sort of education for growers about how to do a better job. Founded the BFA in 2010, held our first conference in 2011. Um, 2012, we had this idea of building a spectrometer that could be used to um, basically give the consumer the ability to, at point of purchase in the grocery store, flash a light at the um, at the crop and get a reading um, as an idea to sort of remove this labels and certification conversation and go directly to the inherent value of the food. Um, we began sort of collaborations 2013, 2014, 15, um, sort of built out the organization. By 2016, we'd um, it looked like the capacity was out there for us to be able to do this, to actually build a, um, a handheld spectrometer. And so we identified some partners um, in that process. Um, 2017, organizationally, we started this, we started working on it. Um, and um, I've got a, this is the, this is the first version um, unit. This is, I've got a, a first generation unit here uh, that we were able to build and sort of release at our annual conference in 2017. Um, I call this the shiny object, even though this one's not very shiny. Uh, the concept here is that we want to, um, you know, inspire economic shifts because we understand that that money directs a lot of action, um, and we want to be able to, you know, have empiricism and transparency be foundational, uh, sort of removing the the you know one one step between the consumer and the farmer or five steps as they may be. Um, where you don't actually know what it is that you're getting. So to do that, we need to do a couple of things. One is to build a meter, sure. A second is to figure out what quality is. And then a third is to figure out what causes quality because we wanna be able to support growers globally um, in implementing best practices to accomplish these results. We think this is uh, deeply synergistic with um, what's being called regenerative ag these days with you know, a focus on on soil carbon and ecosystem function, um, agroecology. You know, there's all kinds of global movements of alternative ag that we believe um, those management practices and techniques correlate with this increase in nutrient levels, which correlates with better human health. So we want to be able to tease out in this soil, on this continent, growing this crop at this season, 
what are the best things to do to be able to really categorically, transparently support the process, not just to build a meter for consumers, but to really be able to, to draw it all the way back to the grower as well. Um, so to that end, um, the, here we have just another graphic of the concept. Um, um, we built a lab in 2018 to begin testing um, crops. Uh, we started out with carrots and spinach and we ran samples of hundreds of crops from around uh, North America. We got some variations that were quite profound. Um, here you can see, you know, potassium on top. Uh, we've got about an N of 524. So that means 524 carrots were sampled from across the supply chain around the country. Um, and this uh, potassium, we found a um, 15 to 1 variation between the carrot that had the most relative potassium in it and the one that had the least. Um, that would mean if you were looking to get potassium from your carrots and you found the best one, you would only need to eat one of those to get the same amount of potassium as if you ate 15 of the worst ones. Um, and we've got uh, calcium and zinc here as other examples. And you can see um, in, you know, in general, the peak of the graph is, at the, you know, below the half point, which basically means most of the samples are, so if the, the, the zinc, the bottom right uh, slide there, um, zinc, you know, the vast majority of the samples are, are between you know 20 and 40 and the you know but the best one we found was 90. so almost all the carrots you could find in the supply chain had we'll say 30 on average but some could have 70 or 80 or 90. Um, and so this is parts per million of zinc if we understand that zinc is a critical nutrient um it that many people globally not just in the developing world but the developed world as well are deficient in if we can support you in choosing which carrots to buy from the farmer who's doing a better job, um, you know they get basically better market and you get better health effects. So um, here we've got spinach, uh, um, iron, zinc, and potassium as well. You can see that same basic pattern. Uh, most of the most of the crops don't have much in them. That's the basic point here. Um, 2019, we started working with um, other. Uh, we we set up a second lab in California. And we started to work with growers to document their management practices. What's your soil type? What's your fertility program? What are your management practices? What variety of seed did you plant? When did you plant? Did you irrigate? Did you till? Getting all that metadata. And we started with about 35 farms in 2019 and, um, and began to build this whole platform out now of directly correlating management practices to nutrient variation to the meter. Um, so in 20... Um, 2019, we also added um, kale, lettuce, cherry tomatoes, and grapes. Um, and by the end of that research year, we had enough data to begin to be able to calibrate this meter now so that we can do a red, yellow, green, bottom quartile, middle 50%, top quartile. We can give you a, you know, not a perfect answer, but a, a statistically meaningful answer with this meter when you flash a light at the grocery store about whether this is in the top quartile, bottom quartile, or the middle. So we functionally accomplished proof of concept on this plan. Um, we added uh, another la lab in France in 2020. Uh, we added uh, 14 more crops, oats and wheat and carrots and, uh, sorry, potatoes and beets and blueberries and um, apples. Um, and uh, this is where I think, based on the audience at this conference, I'd like to uh, end here, um, is that this is a, a collaborative process that we're engaging in. Um, our idea is that together, if we all share from our learning, from our own operations as part of a collective, um, we can really systemically begin to tease out these correlations between environmental conditions, management, nutrient variation, and then be able to say, on my farm, I'm doing this. People can learn from each other, um, but I also have crops of this caliber so consumers can find us. Um, so um, this is, I should have changed the date here to 2021. Um, this is my last slide, but we invite attendees um, and anyone you know to uh, reach out if you'd like to engage. We have two labs now in North America where we're engaging this process with growers. Um, we have got one lab in Europe um, where we, we're engaging this process. We're talking to other partners, potential in Australia, New Zealand, uh, India, uh, South America. Um, this is an open source, collaborative, engaged project. Um, but we're really trying to tease out what is nutrient density because this is one of the foundational points is even though we know 
from the science and from our tongues that nutrient variation exists in food, we don't have a definition of what that variation is. And foundationally, our objective is to develop that openly, transparently, and collaboratively, and then engage. This is a very you know rudimentary, simple instrument. There are going to be corporate interests who can bring to bear much more sophisticated versions of this kind of a thing. What we'd like to see um, as a you know NGO globally working on this topic is that those entities calibrate their instruments to our understanding of what quality is. What is nutrient density? Um, it's actually a big complicated project because there's actually tens of thousands of different compounds that naturally exist in food and being able to give a simple number like this carrot's in the 90th percentile or this carrot's in the 20th percentile. If you're going to be doing that honestly, it requires a lot of a lot of good solid science. So um, realfoodcampaign.org is where you can engage um, right now uh, if you're in Europe or North America. Uh, in the future, uh, potentially um, in other continents, uh, you can sign up to be a grower partner in 2021, uh, send in samples, et cetera, uh, or as a, as a consumer, if you want to send in samples as well, we call them citizen scientists. So I think that's my basic presentation for now. I look forward to questions during the question period. Hi, Dan, that, that's just fantastic. Utterly mind-blowing how the range of of nutrition in in some of those graphs i mean I, i'm just blown I away i just gave <laughs> them the antioxidants and polyphenols are 25 to 1 or you know 200 to 1. yeah so i just as a clinician as a medic i'm like blown away it's it's, yeah. it's fascinating i'm really looking forward to some of the questions and i have lots of questions too and um, yeah. we have questions coming in for you um, in a bit but I'm going to actually introduce um, Gillian our next speaker and and then after that you know we will uh, dig a little bit deeper with both of them you know do be putting your questions up as they go along and I'll be feeding them to the speakers later have some coming through already but let me introduce you to Gillian Butler so um, Gillian spent over 40 years here in the UK working with farmers she's a researcher um, at the Newcastle University um, and she's currently re researching um, animal feeding influences on the quality of the food that they produce. Um, and her current research considers the impact of animal management on food quality to identify the key actions that produce milk, meat and eggs that enhance citizen health. So I'm looking forward to listening, Gillian. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, sorry, Sally. Um, and um, thank Elizabeth for inviting me and involving me in this session. Um, for a few years now, our research group has been looking at how we manage the soil or the plants or the animals on the farm and the impact that that has on the food quality, the nutrient density. My particular interest has been focused on animal-based products, especially ruminant-based products, because dairy and, and beef and, and lamb to some extent have been um they don't have a very good reputation uh positive impact on health and we were wanting to investigate that further there's lots of differences we've found in, in food composition but today i just want to focus on one group of nutrients the fatty acid profile in the the milk and the meat that we produce um and and talk about how that might vary between different farming systems. But before I start talking about our results, I want to just put it into context and give a bit of information about um, why it matters and, and um, hopefully explain um, why the fat profile is important for our health. As I mentioned, ruminant products have not a very good reputation as far as fat composition, the bugs in the rumen manage to destroy any unsaturated fats or the vast majority of them. So a lot of our dairy products and, and ruminant meat is, is high in saturated fats, which we know on the whole are not very good for us. But they also have a number of, of beneficial fatty acids. A number of them are, are um unique to ruminant products and I'll say a bit about those in a minute and the balance between the saturated fat and the unsaturated fat in our food um, 
influences the the um, nutritional spec and the the impact on our health whether it is a benefit to our health from these beneficial fats or a metabolic threat because it's high in in saturated fat or trans fats a comment here a bit of a generalization that the unsaturated fats are good for us and there's plenty evidence to show a number of different chronic physical and mental health conditions that are linked to the balance of, of these unsaturated fats, especially our omega-3 fats. Um, and maybe we can explore that later if, if we need to. I'll say a bit more about these, these good fats because for a number of years, the um, dietary guidelines are to reduce fat intake um, for our health. We don't want to have too much fat in our diet. That's okay up to a point, but there is a group of, of particular fats in our diet, the omega-3 fatty acids, where the vast majority of, of the population don't actually consume enough omega-3 fatty acids, especially these long chain fatty acids, EPA, DPA, DHA. And that's where the recommendation is to come uh, to, to um, eat oily fish to get these long chain fatty acids in our diet. So for reducing total fat intake, it's going to reduce our intake of these long chain fatty acids, as well as the more harmful ones. And we took the approach, it was better to try and change the composition of fat in our diet, rather than reduce it per se, reduce the bad ones and increase the beneficial fatty acids. But as I said before, the balance of, of these fatty acids um, is, is quite important. And most Western diets have insufficient omega-3 fatty acids, but far too much omega-6 fatty acids. Just to explain the difference between these two groups, if we come down here to this diagram, these are both essential fatty acids. And that means that our body cannot synthesize linoleic acid or alpha-linolenic acid, similar names. but um, And these fatty acids are long chains of carbon atoms. Each of the bends on these chains is depicts a carbon atom. Some of them have single bonds and others have double bonds. And this is why it's, it's known as a, an unsaturated fatty acid because it has double bonds in it. Saturated fatty acids don't have any double bonds. But omega-6 fatty acids, we come in from the, the methyl end at the end of the carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six. First double bond is six carbons in here. This one, similar length of chain, we've got 18 carbons. The first double bond is one, two, three, and from the end, we've got a double bond. This is an omega-3 fat and that's an omega-6 fat. Ideally, we want no more than three or four omega-6 to one of omega-3 in our diet. Um, but most Western diets are, are not very well balanced and we have an excess of, of omega-6. And that can be detrimental to our health, although it's not particularly well recognized. If we think about the metabolism, and I don't want to go into too many details on this biochemistry, but this is omega-3 fatty acid metabolism, where this is the essential fatty acid, alpha-linolenic, that we can't synthesize. In theory, we ought to be able to synthesize these long-chain omega-3 fats down here, our EPA, DPA, and DHA, through this series of enzyme steps that will remove a hydrogen and add a double bond or it'll add another carbon and 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 we ought to get up to um a long 22 carbons with um uh, six double bonds in it the problem with this metabolism comes because these enzyme systems are shared with omega-6 metabolism so if we have too much of this omega-6 linoleic acid it blocks this metabolic pathway going towards the omega-3. And we, we, that is why, in most cases, we have to 
get these long chain omega-3 fats in our diet rather than rely on natural synthesis. Just as a simplification, omega-3 fats are high in forages, so green leafy vegetation, grasses, clovers, lots of herbs in, in the, the swords that our animals eat. We're going to have more omega-3. Omega-6 are high in cereals and oil seeds, things like soya or sunflower, um, wheat, barley, maize. They're all high in omega-6. So if we feed these to our cattle, we're going to get more omega-6 and less omega-3. And basically, our research just proves that point. There's, first of all, I'll talk about milk composition. Two studies here, one in America and one in the UK, um, where we bought milk that was mainstream milk um, from supermarkets. We had organic milk from supermarkets and we had some pasture fed or grass fed in, in America. It, it, it was certified with Organic Valley grass milk. And in UK, it was the certified with a pasture fed livestock association. And you can see this is the ratio of omega 6 to omega 3. So, and ideally, I said we want between two and four, no more than that in our total diet. So we can see that our pasture fed milk is going to be better for us um, in terms of. Um, streamlining the, the balance in the, in the total diet. If we have figures um, intake of dairy products that are much less or, or lower than the target, it's going to help the overall dietary balance. And with beef, similar study, we bought steak in supermarkets, non-organic and organic steak in supermarkets. We bought some steak from certified pasture fed farms. And we also bought steaks from conservation farms where the cattle were kept primarily for biodiversity or vegetation management for to enhance biodiversity. And again, we can see this um, step change in the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. And here we also looked at the, the ratio of saturated fat to polyunsaturated fat on on this right hand access and we can see we're up at eight or so with the supermarket bought meat but down at um six or just five and a half for our our um or um meat bought from the pasture fed farms so we've got um a lower ratio so we've got be potentially better synthesis within our body to, to produce these long chain omega-3s but this slide here shows the level of long chain omega-3 our EPA, DPA and DHA so the green, the purple and the turquoise bars here at the top of each each block shows we've got much higher levels of these um, beneficial fats in in the meat coming from the pasture systems compared to mainstream meat in the supermarkets. And my conclusion is that red meat is a valuable source of these good fats, especially long chain omega-3 fats. The composition is strongly influenced by feeds and feeding. So to go to Sally's point, um, not all meat is going to be the same. If we have um, beef coming from a feedlot where they're fed high levels of, of cereals, we're going to have more omega-6, so less chance of synthesizing long-chain omega-3 fatty acids. Forages, especially grazing, is the key element of the production system that's going to enhance the food quality, where we can get more of the omega-3 fats, these long-chain omega-3 and also less omega-6, which gives us a chance for our metabolism to convert some of the alpha linolenic into these long chain fatty acids. Um, and the, the work with the, the pasture fed livestock and the conservation uh, farm shows that there is scope to improve that composition even more. Um, this was just a preliminary study. We've got um, more work to do and maybe see how far we can go at enhancing food quality. So, as I say, 
I focused on a single um, nutrient um, or group of nutrients in this case, but it does show real differences in the production system. Okay, we can open it up. Back to you, Sally. Thanks, Gillian. That's, um, I mean, it's, it's brilliant. I think in my job, I think we're learning more and more and understanding that actually inflammation and the imbalance of these fats are, are actually one of the mechanisms that is driving a lot of chronic diseases. And, and um, I personally, in my private clinic, do measure a lot of these ratios. And quite frankly, a lot of people who are coming to me um, have ratios of up to 1 to 15 pro-inflammation. And we know that this is driving you know, your heart disease, your diabetes, your obesity story, your depression story, and, uh, and the importance actually to befriend fats. Like we need to get away from some of this, you know, some foods are bad and some foods are good. Um, and, you know, and re-embrace and understand the importance, you know, of fats in our diet and especially brain health, like Alzheimer's is a massive problem. And EPA and DHA, those fats you were discussing are just so important for brain health as well. Mm. Um, so just just so important that we, we, we befriend these things. And so thank you for that. And um, just a quick question just from, from me, um, Gillian, as a consumer. So a lot of my patients will say, I hear you, Sally, I want to eat well, I want to choose well. Am I looking for a label? Where can I get this kind of food? You know, how do I feed my family? What, what are your reflections on that here in the UK? Are there resources that, that people can use? Um. <laughs> The, you it's not easy to find it you have to really want to find it but the pasture fed livestock association website um and i can maybe put that in a link somewhere um does give a list of farmers that are certified so um and and most of them do direct sell there's very few of them will sell into the supermarket so unfortunately it's not easy for consumers to find this this good milk or meat um but there is a growing infrastructure of the farm farms themselves that are desperately trying to sell their products um and can be traced from the pfla website excellent so somebody can go on that website find their local farmer and approach them directly and that's yeah. for, for dairy as well as meat yes although there's there's um not as many farms certified on the dairy side um, but um, as I say, it is a growing number and a growing infrastructure. And the more people we can get to convert and to certify, the wider the benefits and to society and the environment. It would be great if we could get this to take off board. Mm -hmm. Excellent, great. And um, I think we're now sort of open for a, a sort of panel discussion. So if people have got questions, if they just want to feed that into the chat, um and maybe if we can get Stan back up on the screen and uh ask him some questions can we do that Josh excellent here he is welcome back Dan thank you <laughs> thank you for that you've already um somebody did ask earlier about having a link to purchase your spectrometer and sort of help finance it and I understand you've also you've put the links out there in response to that is that right i did i don't i'm assuming they got transitioned to the where everybody else is experiencing us from but Excellent. yes <laughs> okay um so dan you know uh, one of the things i wanted to ask like if we were to fast forward sort of five ten years you know into the future um what change do you envisage sort of in the food and farming system as a result of the work um, that you're doing um and, and what would you like to see as business as usual um yeah well i uh i would say that you know in two years or so we will have i mean the meters we've got right now like i said they're pretty rudimentary they they function but they're rudimentary they're we're building them one at a time you know batches of 100 or 200 not 200,000 um i think you know as we've been working on this project for the past you know 10 years or more now i think um when we first started talking about nutrient density as a concept, it was, there wasn't even a word much for it. It was like, what is that thing that is like, everybody knows about it, but there wasn't even a conversation about it. So we helped to coin that term. Um, 
And these days it feels like, um, especially with the regenerative movement coming on so strongly and the, you know, awareness about the climate, um, irregularities and balances, um, there's a lot of interest from the supply chain um, and beginning to, to piece these things together. They're saying, okay, we understand that people care about the climate and that's important. And we understand now that maybe there's a connection between agriculture and climate, but when we do our, our market research, we find that actually consumers care more about their health than they do about the climate health. Mm -hmm. And um, is it possible that we can connect these things? And so mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a global conversation and a sort of awareness coalescing going on. I think we're well poised. Um, so, you know, let's say in two years we've got a mass market instrument um, available uh, and we have a framework for growers to actively engage between each other um, in understanding what works most well in their in their region, in their crop type, in their sort of cultural framework, et cetera. Um, you know, I think the sky's the limit, really. I think, um, I mean, when was it before cell phones came out? And, you know, it might have been an idea, but, but the world has been totally transformed. I think if we have ray guns, if we have the ability to actually see what things are um that was going to basically mean that the the labeling certification framework which i liken to a sort of a religious structure that gets between ourselves and the divine um you know we don't need that intermediary anymore we can have the direct perception as it were um so yeah i think um we're starting to sequester carbon in significant um quantity globally i think we're starting to heal the environment um i think the incidence of chronic illness uh, is beginning to reverse um I, I don't know i think you know it's entirely plausible that we who all care deeply about each other and ourselves and the world around us mm -hmm. um through using this kind of a metric a vector uh you know a, a, a an instrument um can use our power our money which is you know most people like i said at the beginning buy food with money and money does seem to direct the world to some significant degree. So if we begin to reorient how we use our money in this one thing, you don't have to buy a Prius or, or whatever else, just choose the food that's most nutritious for your family. Um, the often that sounds actually taste, isn't it? Because at the end What's of the that? day, I was saying, often um it comes down to taste as well like you know great food but what i've learned over the last few and years you and you feel better and you feel better right? yeah you, you yeah. taste good and you feel better so uh, and that's what we're hooked to we're hooked to wanting to feel good and i didn't so make that point i usually do make that point we are animals first and foremost and we're <laughs> wired to discern what's good for us and mm -hmm. that you know children don't eat their fruits and vegetables because they're animals and they know better you know <laughs> It's really simple um, that, you know, the salt, sugar, fat thing, you know, we're mm -hmm. wired for these nutrients, basically, and the supply chain has figured out how to simplify that and pervert it. But functionally, when you do get good food, you, I mean, you, you want more of it. Um, and I, and, you know, all the way, all the way from children up. I think mm -hmm. if, if our food did taste better, we would, you know, eat more of the good stuff. And that's a significant part of it. So. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, certainly what, one of the things that frustrates me in my line of work is just the obsession with calories. Um, and I wondered, you know, what your thoughts are, ha you know, what needs to happen with the different parts of that food chain from producer to consumer that, to kind of help move people on to thinking differently um, around and, and thinking broader around our food. Well, you know, I think the really simple thing where, I mean, we're beginning to understand that you can eat all kinds of carbohydrates, you know, potato chips and still be hungry. It's not the, it's not the calories. It's the nutrients. Our bodies are hungry for nutrients. And when our bodies have had enough, they will tell us we, we're done. So that's my understanding is when you do eat that, you know, grass fed steak or those nutrient dense vegetables or whatever it is, um, you feel full but not heavy. And, you know, it's, if we can get ourselves out of the labels and the numbers and get back into our direct perception of our bodies, mm -hmm. I think that's really where, I mean, all the science is just confirming that our bodies already know. And, you know, I think one of the things Michael Pollan has said is, you know, if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, 
it's probably not food. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that whole thing about it either is junk or it's food, but it can't be both. Mm -hmm. Let's just look at look at what we're doing to ourselves and and have some basic level of humility in our own our own, you know, engagement with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's up to each of us. And I think our bodies, if we begin to use them in the most rudimentary fashion, are all we need to guide us. But it's nice to have the science and the, and the shiny objects also. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, just think we've got some questions coming through. Oh, there are loads. Oh, yes, please bring the questions through. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for the questions. Just waiting for uh, our volunteer just to uh, send them through. Right. Um, let me read it out to you. At this conference, the term regenerative seems to be used and organically rarely mentioned. Um, glad to find that you are using that term. Do you advocate bringing back organic as the guarantor for safe food? I I can speak to that. I, I grew up on an organic farm and my parents um, helped write some of the first organic certification, um, you know, uh, <laughs> standards in, the, in, in North America in the 80s. Um, and I have been a, an organic farmer my entire life. Um, and I think that what we're, you know, what organic means now is a, it's a process standard. It's not a quality standard. Um, biodynamics, um, agroecology, permaculture, you know, regenerative, all, none of these things to my understanding are, I mean, maybe non-GMO is, is, a, is testing that you don't have GMOs but we actually don't have a standard which says it does have nutrients. Um, so there's one thing to be afraid of toxins, which is entirely justifiable, but what we're really looking for is nutrition. And, you know, uh, organic is a binary. It's either you are organic or not organic. And um, I think life is not binary. We need to have a, 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 a you know, a, a bell curve, a, continu a continuum. So this is in the 80th percentile. This is in the 40th percentile. Make your choices accordingly. Um, some people that are certified organic are doing a great job, and some people that are certified organic are actually doing some quite destructive things to the environment. And some people that are not certified organic are doing quite beneficial things to the environment. So I think we really need to get outside of that sort of that binary paradigm, um, even well, though I, I do I, have organic credentials. I, yes. See, organic, it's a legal definition, and they have to comply yeah. with certain standards. And because of that, in my line of work with like like the the livestock feeding they've got to have at least 60 percent forage in the diet as right. so it will be better than mainstream that could have maybe 10 or 15 percent but your pasture fed has to have 100 percent forage in their diet so it goes that much further so mm -hmm. organic and as a label have a quality forage and that's the thing is it's not just the forage it's the quality of the forage right? yeah the, but it's it's one step better than yeah. mainstream but it's not as good as going the 100 percent forage in in the perspective where i'm coming from anyway yeah um, and i've got a couple of practical questions that have been asked about your um your meter is this measuring minerals or is it also measuring phytonutrients on your spectrometer um, and a second question let me ask both um would it be possible for the public sector to use this tool to assess the nutritional qualities of supplier samples during the procurement process? Uh, right now, the meter is calibrated to uh, antioxidants and polyphenols, not to minerals, uh, in truth. Um, so yes, the idea, and this is part of the question about what is nutrient density, because it involves the amino acid profiles, the lipid profiles, the enzymes, the vitamins, all these different compounds and nutrients not just one or two and that's what we don't know we don't actually know what is good and what is bad what are the appropriate levels and ratios we've got good ideas but we don't have a like a consensus um and yes uh supply chain um you know partners allies are i think going to be some of the the um early adopter big movers uh they they can use this we're already working with some pretty big companies here in north america actually and in in france too um who have an interest basically in saying that our food is of superior nature. And so they're, our objective is to collaborate with anybody who wants to collaborate, whether you're a grower or an agronomist or a buyer, wholesaler, retailer, consumer, chef, nutritionist, anybody that wants to collaborate in this process is welcome to, and we're not gonna 
but we'll try not to say anything bad about anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but we're just going to try to figure it out. Okay. So, and and there's quite, a, a, quite a few questions that maybe both of you could comment on about um, how expensive some of these products are um, and how, you know, low income families might not be able to access regeneratively farm meat um, or nutrient dense vegetables. We won't call it organic. And, and uh, have you any ideas on how to change this? I mean, I have some ideas because I work with a real range of um, people with different budgets. But um, what were your thoughts on, on this? idea of it being very elite and how do we make this mainstream and affordable yeah you're muted Gillian. Oh, Gillian, you're muted just uh unmute yourself they say i was typing an answer to, to the, these questions looking at them there and i thought it'd be much easier just to talk about it um i think not in terms of accessibility or affordability it it maybe brings home that we maybe ought to be eating less meat better quality meat um, and I'm not advocating eating pasture fed steaks every day in the week but occasionally so society needs to, to look at um, eating less meat but, but better quality milk and dairy um, and the other thing that comes into it is I mentioned it was like a developing system there's only a few pioneer farm well not a few there's so PFLE have 500, 600 members, but as the system develops or we recognize the benefits, hopefully it will become more mainstream and it will be become more affordable. And so, I'll, sorry. I'll just say that I think um, you know there's a there's a lot of a lot of pieces to that to that and we don't have time for them all, but um, the more that we can increase the ambient nutrient levels in food, the more that all food will be better. And that's that's foundationally our objective. Our, the mission of our organization is to increase quality in the food supply, period. And we ideally want to be doing it for everyone. I would say that um, if we can identify economic actors who have incentives, like I, you have the national health system in, in England, Great Britain, we have... Um, you know, whatever the uh, Obamacare they call it. Um, there's insurance companies who actually, or, 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 or private insurance, you know, there's, if people are less sick, then the mm -hmm. costs of taking care of them, so if, if, you know, I think we do have the opportunities through legislation, through, you know, working with, with significant, you know, in, our, in, in the States, it's the insurance companies. They have a strong interest, and they're doing some really good work. And the, you know, healthcare system is doing some really, really creative, you know, stuff. Saying if people are given, you know, de delivered, well, you know, complete meals every day that after they leave the hospital for thirty days, the readmission rate is dramatically reduced, and we actually save four dollars for every dollar we spend, or save six dollars for every dollar we spend. So, um, we have you know people that are on on you know reduced income. You know, subsidies, they get checks every month, WIC or, or, I mean, there are ways for the system to systemically incentivize this by saying it's not just the calorie, it's the quality. And mm -hmm. if we got some big governmental buyers to say, we're going to be buying, we will buy it for the, for the, you know, for the um, elementary schools, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's lots of there. Yeah. I mean, there's so I'm much isn't there that if we feed our kids well and we get that right at the beginning that that just sets them up for the rest of their life in terms of reducing you know the risk of all chronic disease and you know it starts right from education and te or teaching how to cook and the love of that food and what we're feeding in schools what we're feeding in hospitals which here in the nhs is awful um yeah. and actually actually convincing a lot of my colleagues that food matters i mean we there, there's some work to be done in terms of our mindsets we're actually coming to um close now but we we will be offering a zoom uh, link for people who want to carry on with the discussion there's still quite a few unanswered questions um but want to thank you uh, dan and Gillian, for your presentations and um this is just so important and topical in terms of recovering our health as nations and it's really exciting to hear you guys digging that deeper and seeing where this might be going on in the future i'm going to be popping up just some slides to end 
Um, Elizabeth Westaway, Dr. Elizabeth Westaway, she's an international public health nutrition specialist. And she was the one actually that brought this together. Um, and uh, she wanted to be here to share and finish the last couple of minutes that we have together. Um, but she's had some techno technological issues um, of getting on. So I'm going to just talk um, her slides through. So we will see you in the Zoom room. Uh, I think all three of us will be there and that we can continue to have a look at some of these questions and continue the discussion. But if Josh could uh, put up those slides of Elizabeth and I will um, have a quick look and try and read through them for you. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> I can very on carry on talking. But I, just... I don't know. I don't know where they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me put in the chat. And we have the slides. Yeah, and we also need the link for the Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In the chat, uh, please. Can you pop that in the chat as well? Um, so Elizabeth, I'm, I'm reading very much what she, she's put for her slide, so forgive me, but she's put here how in organising sessions she had wanted um, people to start thinking about and think more about what is in their food and how it's being produced. And food must be nourishing to improve citizen health and to reduce the prevalence of diet related non communicable diseases. For food to transform us, it must be nutrient dense. And for it to be nutrient dense, it must be grown in healthy soils, teeming with soil life. So if we go on to the next slide, I don't have control over them. So Josh, you're gonna have to go on. Josh had said, oh. There we go. So um, if anybody wants to get in touch with any of us with questions and um, the details are there, um, I think you'll also find some of those details in the um, notes about all the speakers as well. Um, and on that third slide, I think um, she just wanted to also just highlight that I'm back on in a session with um, the farm ed guys, with John T and with a nutritionist and chef. And we're going to be talking about the whole link between um, uh, soil health and gut health. And that's Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, I'm going to be able to talk a lot more about health then. So do I noticed some of the questions were medical and I would love to dig deeper. So do join us then. Um, but also here in the UK, there are some other links of people who are digging deeper in the UK, looking at these questions around nutrient density and the quality of our food. Um, and she just wanted to do a shout out for those as the Sustainable Food Trust, um, Foom, Food Farming and the Countryside Commission, Ragman Lane's Farm, and growing real food for nutrition. And then that next slide. Oh, that was me doing a shout out, yes, from soil to gut health. Um, so yeah, well, I've done that bit. And then the final slide, she wanted to um, just finish with a quote from Charles Matty. I haven't seen his session yet. He was my conversion into understanding regenerative farming. His book was hugely healthy, uh, helpful for me. Um, but on that last slide, she just put that quote about if people ate truly nutrient rich food out of a healthy soil, you would slash the national health bill straight away. The big chemical companies and big food companies know exactly what they are doing. It is now causing millions of death. Tell me why this is not a genocide. So she wanted to finish with that <laughs> by Charles Massey, um, which I think we would all agree with here um, that yes, we need to get back to some nutrient dense food to recover the health of our nations. So thank you. And I think the Zoom link has been put into the chat. So we will carry on over there and, uh, and um, continue with the questions in the chat. Thank you for joining us. Bye.